<laughs> you want me to put them back on? <laughs> no, that's fine. I think I'm getting a, a glare from the glasses, you know, with the sun. Okay. Okay, let's begin. Um, for the record, please say your name and your current address. My name is Lou Grassick. 5027 State Highway 30A, Fultonville, New York, 12072. Okay. And what year did you join the U.S. Navy? In July of 1943. Were you enlisted or were you drafted? I enlisted. Were you in the regular Navy or the Navy Reserves? Navy Reserve. How long did you serve and, and during what period? During World War II from 43 to April of 46 and get called back in for the Korean thing. When you enlisted, how old were you? 17. Where were you living when you were enlisted? I lived in Ridgewood, Queens, down at the Big Apple. Did you have any uh, prior experiences at sea? None whatsoever. Um, what family did you leave when you left home for the Navy? I left my mom, dad, and sister, my older sister. What were your feelings about leaving? Well, at that time, with the war going on, already it was going on for one year, and I, I probably would have gotten in sooner if dad would have signed sooner, but he wanted me to finish high school, which I did. Uh, oh. I had mixed emotions. A lot of my uh, buddies already were in. Uh, prior to enlisting, uh, what did you do in your civilian life besides going to school? I went right from high school. Were you a Boy Scout by chance? No, I wasn't. Later on, I became a Cub Scout leader. <laughs> when you joined the Navy, uh, what were your first experiences? Well, I went to Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, we went to Boots there for, I think it was eight weeks. And uh, it was the first time I've been away from home. And we had a company of about 150 men. And uh, I felt bad, but it was the first time that I heard grown men. And at the age of 17, I felt I was a grown man crying in their bunks. What were your first impressions of boot camp? Of the Navy? Uh, boot camp. Oh, boot camp. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was something new, getting up at 5.30 in the morning, putting on a pair of trunks, and going out on a grinder. Uh, and even though it was uh, July, it was cold that early in the morning. But uh, I didn't mind it at all. Um, where did you go after boot camp? Uh, I went to uh, fireman school up in Boston, Massachusetts. I spent... Uh, I believe it was seven or eight weeks up there, and uh, came out as fireman first. Then, let me get a break. Get a break. Back on camera. Back on camera. Okay. What was the destroyer escort uh, which you served on? The, uh, the destroyer escort Reeves. I uh, picked it up at uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard when she returned from a trip. I believe the trip was from North Africa. Uh, that was in, uh, in January of uh, 44. And uh, I stayed aboard for about three days. And by the way, I, Ridgewood, Queens was about a half hour away from Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, you know, it was great being that close to home. So we only spent three days there and we took the next convoy over. Um, how long did you serve on the ship? Uh, from January of 44 and I decommissioned the ship in Green Coast Springs, Florida in uh, April of 46. She eventually became uh, decommissioned in July of uh, 46. What was your first experience with a destroyer escort? Well, it didn't take too long. I got aboard it in uh, January. And in uh, March, I think it was somewhere around 
March 16th or 15th, uh, the SSCK, which was a tanker in our convoy group, uh, got torpedoed up forward. And um, by the time we got to her, she was had a starboard list to her, and a lot of the crew was in the water in their uh, whale boats, and the skipper of the uh, tanker was all by himself on a, a life raft. Um, we could have proceeded to pick up 84 of her 85 men, that included the armed guard. Uh, in those days, the, all the merchant vessels in the convoy had an armed guard, which was uh, strictly Navy personnel. We lost one man, and uh, basically the, the reason we lost it, when we pulled up alongside these uh, lifeboats, we tried to calm these people to not all come to the one side at one time, that we would eventually get them up. And, uh, and basically what happened on a one life raft, they all come rushing to the one side and they turned it over. And the one man that we lost was caught underneath the life raft and we didn't realize that until the next day when we went out, found a life raft, turned it back over again, and sure enough the seaman was under there. We gave him a uh, burial at sea the next day. But the story of the CK doesn't end there. She wouldn't sink. And uh, approximately 40 foot of a, of a stern was sticking out. The screws and the rudder were showing. And evidently it was a big air pocket below the water line that kept her up. The Commodore of the convoy told us we have to stay with it until she sinks or do something to it to make it sink because it was a menace to navigation and the next convoy was approximately a day and a half behind us and they would come into this hulk of a, of a tanker probably during the night hours and that would create havoc with the convoy. The skipper decided to use the three-inch guns and we fired 88 shells at the portion of the tanker that was remained above water. We hit it over 60 times. It didn't do any good. In fact, some of the three-inch shells were bouncing off the hull. Finally, the skipper realized that we cannot get below the water line with our three-inch guns. So he decided, let's try and torpedo her. Well, before we took this convoy out, we went up to Casco Bay, Portland, uh, off of Portland, uh, Maine, and we had tried out our torpedoes. At that time, we had three torpedoes aboard. And when we tried them out in drill, we ended up chasing all over the ocean to get them to retrieve them because they just didn't work. So he, the skipper was talked out of torpedo on the CK, and finally they came up with the idea of sinking it with K guns or depth charges. Now my battle station happened to be at the time the starboard K guns. So we loaded them up. I set mine at 25 foot. The other three were at 50, 25, and 50. And we pull up alongside of the CK, doing about two-thirds speed, and sent out the four depth charges. They're fired approximately five seconds apart. And when the depth charges got underneath the CK and blew up, the CK came out of the water approximately another 40 feet and went down with one big whoosh. And that did it. The crew later on kitted the four of us there's one man to each K-gun, plus the talker that gave us the settings as sinking an American tanker. You got a picture on the stack there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was hectic. Okay, back on camera. All right.
When you first boarded the, the ship, uh, what was your rating and rate? I was a fireman first class. I got assigned to the number two fire room. Assigned as firing up the boiler in number two fire room. There were three of us. At that time, I would take care of the burners. We had one man that would take care of the water going into the boilers, and another man taking care of the, the blowers, the air. Uh, I had that watch all while I was in the Atlantic. Uh, when we went into the Pacific, I had uh, I received a, a petty officer's third class crow, and I ended up on the evaporator watch, but also in a number two fire room. The only difference was I was on the upper level instead of being in a lower level. Evaporators meaning making fresh water for the crew. How did you learn about uh, shipboard routine? Hold it up. Wait till this is over with. <laughs> it's good background. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, We're taking off. What was the question? Uh, how did you learn about uh, the shipboard routine? Oh, you, you, you learn in a hurry. Uh, you, you learn how to take care of yourself. Uh, you learn how to make friends with uh, people in your own compartment. There was uh, approximately 207 men aboard our ship, of which I believe it was 10 or 11 of those were officers. And uh, my sleeping quarters was right below where we're sitting right now, a little up forward more the after cruise quarters and it didn't take long to get uh, used to shipboard routine after all you only had 306 feet to maneuver with with 36 inch across so you sort of hemmed in and you make friends in a hurry uh, did you spend any time as a uh, mess cook oh yeah uh, even though I was a fireman first class it was my first sea duty and I had mess cooking for one week. Uh, before we even got the first trip to Ireland, uh, in fact, when we took on the survivors of the CK is when they relieved me of my duty of uh, mess cooking. Uh, I don't know if it was some sort of reward or what, but generally mess cooking, you would stay aboard for at least two or three weeks. But uh, being I had uh, K-guns as a uh, uh, battle station, I also had the job of pulling the guys out of the drink and out of the uh, life rafts. So maybe they felt that uh, uh, give them a break and get them out of mess cooking. Um, when you advanced to a higher rate, uh, did you receive formal training in your rating or did you serve as a striker? No, I served as a striker. Yeah. Uh, what shipboard equipment did you operate? Shipboard? Equipment. Equipment. Uh, strictly down a fire room, we would take care of the uh, reciprocating and centrifugal pumps. Uh, I would uh, clean the uh, nozzles that uh, were in the, uh, in the fire boxes. Uh, later on, when I uh, uh, went to evaporator watch, we'd actually have to take the evaporators apart at least once every six months and clean them out. Uh, that was a terrible job, an awful smell. The smell of uh, really like dead fish. Because basically the evaporator makes fresh water out of salt water. Ben, let's do a sound check on you. Sound check. There's that foul. We're back on. Back on. Um, okay. Did your equipment always work? No, not always. We'd, we'd always have to repair and maintain them. And a lot of times when we'd come into Brooklyn Navy Yard, we would go to the various shops as they call them at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and sort of borrow some of the equipment to get ours up to snuff. <laughs> uh, they would call that in the Navy midnight raids. <laughs> um, was your equipment easy to operate? Oh yeah, the equipment was uh, 
usually you had a, uh, a petty officer that was experienced enough to show you what to do and what not to do. Okay. Um, with your um, performance, uh, did you provide any support to uh, other crew members and officers? Any support? Uh, as a, uh, at that time, a third class petty officer, we really didn't have to do too much with, uh, with the officers. We strictly dealt with, uh, with our first class and our chiefs. Uh, they're the ones that uh, we would have to support and uh, do our work for them. If, if we didn't uh, produce, they're the ones that uh, got it from the officers. What watches and watch sections did you routinely stand? Oh, all of them. Uh, it was four on and eight off, and they would uh, rotate them. You had three divisions, first, second, and third division. Uh, if you had the midnight watch, you get woke up about 11.30 at night, get on your watch, and then uh, approximately quarter after four or so in the morning, you'd get off that watch. Uh, you'd hit the rack. Uh, the mid-watch had the uh, pleasure of sleeping in, but if you wanted to miss breakfast, sometimes you didn't want to sleep in. <laughs> what were your specific duties during the watch? While I was a fireman, was strictly tending the boiler to make sure that we had enough burners in there to maintain the proper steam, which was, uh, now I'm going to get a little confused. I'm pretty sure on the DE it was 400, 400, 450 degrees. Later on I was on a tin can and it was more like 600 and 650 degrees. I'm pretty sure the DE was for, uh, 400. 400 450 degrees. Um, it was all superheated steam now. Did you favor uh, one watch over another? Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you always uh, favored the, uh, I did anyhow, the 8 to noon watch. Uh, because that meant that uh, I, I had a watch but I didn't have to work. <laughs> And you couldn't do both. And while I was on watch, the rest of the crew would be down below uh, repairing pumps or, or just cleaning up. Uh, so the eight, eight, uh, 8 in the morning till 12 noon, I favored. Uh, did you do the same basic duties during general quarters? Uh, no, my duties on general quarters was on the K-guns. Uh, all while I was in the Atlantic, uh, I was on the K-guns and then once we went into the Pacific uh, we got our K-guns removed and I ended up in repair party 2 which is approximately a midship uh, of an APD amphibious personnel destroyer how long would you uh, remain at general quarters uh, we would remain on general quarters until the enemy was out of the area uh, I remember in uh, Okinawa, we were on a picket line, and uh, basically we, we remained on the uh, uh, general quarters. There were all sorts of conditions, though. You had a one, two, and three condition in, in general quarters. But basically, uh, I was at general quarters for almost three days. Under those conditions of one, two, and three, which basically meant, uh, uh, I forget which it was now, one or the other where you could relax a little bit and uh, possibly read something. Uh, uh, how frequently would you be called to a GQ? To a detail? Uh, to a GQ. Oh, GQ? <laughs> yeah. We're going to it right now. <laughs> uh, 
Well, when we were on the picket line in, in the Pacific, we were out there on the picket line for approximately 109 days. From what I understand, the 105th Transport Division, which we belong to in the Pacific, we served out on the picket line the longest. And uh, our function out there was to, besides fighting kamikazes and remaining on the picket line, and reporting into Okinawa as to how many planes are coming in. Uh, we also, being we're an APD and we could take on a wounded personnel, uh, because now we had accommodations for uh, 150 additional men above our crew, uh, we would go alongside of a, a ship that, that got hit by a kamikaze, send our doctors over there to take care of them, and need be, take the wounded uh, board and uh, take them into Camerata um, to be tended to by the, uh, I forget what hospital ship was in there, but I think the Comfort was one of them. Did you be, uh, perform general quarters drills often? General quarters out in Okinawa was every day, every day. And uh, as far as convoy duty went, as long, uh, in fact, every morning, every dusk and dawn, we would be at general quarters because that's basically the time the U-boats would strike. Uh, after about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, we would secure and go through regular ship's routine until one of the DEs would pick up a, a submarine contact. Then we'd go to general quarters again. In the Pacific, every time a bogey would come in, and that's a, a Japanese uh, plane, would come in, we'd go to general quarters. Even if they were 30 miles away, we would go to general quarters. <clears throat> what special sea details were you involved with? Special sea details? Down in the fire room. And uh, that's when it became hectic, down in the fire room because you were coming into a dock or you were coming into an anchorage and uh, you never knew when you were going to go full astern or full forward. Uh, when you do these maneuvers is when you suck up the uh, steam out of the boilers and that's where you have to start changing nozzles. There were three nozzles in a furnace, uh, in a firebox, and you had to maintain those three nozzles uh, depending on how much steam was required. The big thing was, keep your full head of steam. Did you have any active role during underway refueling or replenishment details? Uh, a refueling detail, yeah. I was, uh, again, on the starboard side. If we refueled on the starboard side, uh, we would man the hoses. We had a starboard side crew and a port side crew. So, basically, how we ran up against the tanker, uh, from what side we would approach it uh, depended on who was going to get that special sea detail of refueling. And I remember one time the hose let go. Uh, actually the ships parted. The hose let go and there was at least a half a dozen of us full of oil from head to toe. You just took your dungarees and whatever you wore and deep six them. No sense in washing those anymore. Did heavy seas and uh, bad weather make these exercises more difficult? Uh, definitely. Uh, all our uh, convoys went through the North Atlantic. And the reason for that is, if it was rough for us, it was just as rough for the U-boats. And they couldn't get their shots off properly. <coughs> uh, you were constantly hanging on, especially a vessel of this type. Uh, most of the times, we wouldn't change clothes until about three or four days later. Uh, you slept with your clothes. It was no fun even taking a shower because you'd, you'd get beat all the hell in, in the shower. Uh, at times it got so rough that you no longer had proper three meals a day. They would make up sandwiches for you and pass out the sandwiches. Because the cooks had a hard time. If you ever look in our galleys of the DEs, they were small. And they used to get tossed around. You really couldn't cook in bad weather. 
The seas at one time, I recall, our mast is 90 foot above this main deck. And when our bow would dip into the ocean and come back up again, the spray would go over the radar mast, the bed spring as we called it. And that spray would come right here where we're sitting. Um, when the ship was at sea for an extended period of time, how frequently would your refuel and replenishment take place? Our average trip to uh, the British Isles was approximately 13 days. And that's zigzagging. If we got into any trouble, it would take us a little longer. But we made it all the way across, so evidently we had enough fuel to cover anywhere from, well, even with the Darnell, we stayed out there approximately two extra days. Uh, I would say it was good enough for 15 or 16 days without refueling at sea, because the North Atlantic is one place you don't refuel at. Uh, in the Pacific, uh, well, we have a lot of times we'd have to come in and take on stores, take on ammunition, and of course take on fuel. But we, we would come off the picket line uh, just about every seven or eight days, come in, pick up mail, and I would be strictly anchoring off Okinawa to do this and take on stores and then go right out to the picket line. We would never get any liberty in Okinawa, that's for sure, because they were still fighting there. Uh, did you ever experience an emergency breakaway? An emergency breakaway? Oh, uh, yeah, I believe that's with refueling, where the hoses, we had to break away. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, we did that in the, uh, in the Pacific, where we parted our fuel lines. Uh, I think I explained that to you already. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was a breakaway. Okay. Um, did you uh, ever ride on a bosun's chair during a ship-to-ship -ship transfer? No, thank God for that. <laughs> I've seen many of them go across, and there wasn't one that arrived there dry at all, no matter how calm it was. I don't even know if I'm really looking at the camera or not. You're looking good. Uh, am I? Yeah. Okay. I'm sort of looking down here because I'm getting a little glare up here, but if down here I'm right. Okay, we're back on. Back on. Okay. While on the shore escorts, who were your COs? <coughs> uh, well, as a third class petty officer, well, well, what do you mean by COs now? The commanding officer? Yeah, commanding officer. Oh, okay. Uh, while I was aboard that ship, we had uh, three commanding officers. We started off in the Atlantic when I got aboard in uh, uh, January of uh, 44 with Captain Jim Durney. Uh, he was only a, a full lieutenant, but uh, regardless of rank, we always call him a, a captain or a skipper, or the old man. And he later on became lieutenant commander. And then when we went into the Pacific, we had a, uh, again, a lieutenant who later on became a lieutenant commander, uh, Park, P-A-R-K. And then later on in the Pacific, we had a lieutenant commander by the name of uh, Dallas. And that was the three commanders that uh, I had while I was on board the Reeves. The commissioning uh, skipper, I can't think of his name right now, although I, I know it if I, I would look it up. But we had four skippers aboard that ship in the 37 uh, months that it was in existence. And all four of them are now deceased. What leadership style did they use? I, I didn't get you on that one. Uh, what leadership style did they use? What leadership style did they use? Leadership? Yeah. Were they like by the books or were they casual or? Oh, we, board of DE were very casual. Even board the destroyers were casual. Uh, we did have uh, books to read while you were striking for that uh, particular uh, whatever you're going for. But uh, 
During World War II, there wasn't too much testing going on. Uh, in other words, uh, going to school or anything like this. You want to cut while you're here? Or? Was a CO detached or very personable? They were somewhat personable. Uh, they would hang out in their um, officer's country, but every now and then they'd come around and uh, talk to you, introduce themselves to you, because the only time you'd really see him is uh, when he came aboard and he took his orders, would be all on a fantail and uh, would meet him. But later on when he was aboard for a couple of months, he'd come around and shake a hand, would want to know where you're from. Did you ha um, ever have any first-hand experiences in officer's country? No, I had the uh, honor of not ever getting a captain's mast. <laughs> what was your overall impression of the quality of other officers? Well, as a youngster of 17, 18, I think I was 21 when I got out, these officers were all older than I was. And uh, you, you think of it now, they were only maybe eight years older. But those eight years was a big span of experience. And uh, I don't know, in my day, we respected age. So I, I never had any problem with any of the officers, really. I respected them and hope that they respect me. What about your chiefs or leading petty officers? Uh, oh, I had some hard-nosed chiefs because we were closer to chiefs than we were to the officers. But uh, basically, if you did your job, uh, the chief had no course to get on your back. Of course, there were, there were favorites that the chiefs had and uh, possibly uh, they would, the favorites would get the better jobs and you'd get the uh, dirtier job, so to speak. But uh, they, they treated us pretty well. Uh, most of them were reservists, too, on a, on a DE I was on. Uh, most of the regular Navy chiefs that uh, in 1944, when I got aboard, were slowly being transferred, I guess, to larger ships due to their experience. And the experience that the reservists were getting, I guess they could trust us by ourselves now. Um, did you have any leadership responsibilities? Uh, the only leadership uh, responsibilities I had uh, is uh, as, a, as a third class petty officer to make sure that that evaporator is working properly and it's putting out water. And uh, if it wasn't putting out the fresh water and, and the crew was full, uh, forced to take salt water showers, uh, I know they would come to the evaporator to watch people and start chewing us out. You know, we're not doing our job. What's happening? How come we got to take salt water showers? Aboard a, uh, a steam turbine type of ship, the number one choice was the feed bottoms. They had to get all the water. Number two choice was your uh, uh, food, cooking, drinking. Your third choice was showering and washing. If the first two choices wasn't taken care of, you had to take a salt water shower. We're on. Okay. Um, I understand that your ship, the uh, USS Reeves, was involved with uh, picket duty in uh, Okinawa. Uh, would you care to relate your personal experiences during the, uh, this picket duty? Uh, we got to uh, Comrade on March 26th with a UDT team that we've never had the opportunity to use. Uh, instead, our sister ship, the Hopping, utilized her UDT team while we stood by. Uh, from March 26th, we stood around patrolling the area, and finally on Easter Sunday, April 1st, uh, we went into Okinawa.
again we stood by uh, watching the big ships throw lobbing shells in after the uh, troops were put on a beach they had destroyers and even smaller ships than destroyers LCIs LSTs anything that could put up some any aircraft fire out on picket duty the idea of the picket duty was to screen the island of Okinawa approximately 30 to 40 miles circumference so that nothing would come in and we could pre-warn the people on Okinawa, our troops, of what's coming in. Uh, I believe it was on April 7th while we were on picket duty when we got the word that the, Yama, the battleship Yamamoto was coming down. And, uh, well, to be truthful with you, it was about the first time that I, I really was scared of facing a battleship. I couldn't see that. So they had all the smaller ships go in to Buckner Bay and they left the destroyers out there and all the heavyweights that were out there that we didn't even see because they were out further than 30, 40 miles. And they intercepted the uh, uh, Yamamoto and sunk her with aircraft. But we were on the picket line for 109 days. And, of course, you're not out there steady 109. You're coming in, picking up uh, uh, mail. Uh, you're, you're picking up uh, uh, fuel oil. You're picking up supplies, food. But that would only last maybe 12 hours, and you'd be right out on a picket duty, a picket line again. Uh, we saw a couple of ships get hit, and we had to go through their raid. Uh, USS Brain is one of them that sticks in my mind because we had to ship our doctors over there. They got hit with two kamikazes. Uh, we didn't get our ba uh, doctor back until a week later because they towed the Brain into Camarada and our doctor and our chief pharmacist mate got transferred to the USS Anthony, another destroyer. And uh, we didn't get together with the Anthony until about a, a week later, and we finally got our doctor and our uh, pharmacist mate back aboard. Uh, while we're on picket duty ourselves, we, we knocked down two planes. One of them was a Val, and the other one was a Betty. A Betty is a bomber, and a Val is a, a, a fighter, I believe it was. Uh, I saw the Betty come down. Uh, we, we were on one of those GQ, uh, not a full GQ where you could relax. I was in repair party two. I came topside and all of a sudden all the action started. And it was a 20 millimeter uh, gunner that, that finally did it in. And when a 20 millimeter gunner does it in, you know he is close. Uh, when we hear the five inch guns going off, we figured, okay, they're out there four or five miles yet. Uh, when you hear the 40s go off, hey, they're, they're within 4,000 yards. When you hear the 20s go off, you know they're within 2,000 yards and getting closer. Okay. <clears throat> uh, going back in uh, time a little bit, that, before the uh, picket duty, um, and uh, anti-submarine action, uh, I understand your uh, sister ship, the uh, Donnell, was hit by an acoustical torpedo. Can you relate this story? Uh, yeah, it was... Uh, we were escorting a convoy of approximately 50 ships, uh, five across, ten back, and they make a, a box formation of 50 ships. The destroyer escorts, the Lawrence would be always up in front, uh, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile in front of the convoy. And then you had the two destroyer escorts on the port side of that box, two destroyer escorts on the starboard side of that box, and the Reeves, we always had the tail end. We always used to call ourselves the gopher. Go for this and go for that. And basically the reason for a DE in back of the convoy, it was if there was any 
any of the ships that had any problems, uh, machinery problems, uh, torpedoing, they would break out of the convoy and we'd have to stay with them for approximately six hours. The reason for the six hours is that, let's say it was a ship that broke down. Uh, it gave us six hours to catch up to the convoy at flank speed. And we'd have to, we'd have to desert the ship that dropped out. Well, the Donnell happened to be on the starboard side of this box formation to the back, to the, to the stern of the entire convoy. And from the story we got from the survivors, they were ready to put their foxing gear out. They did get a contact. In fact, uh, some of the people saw a, a subsurface. This was approximately 9 o'clock in the morning, and that's when they liked to the strike. And before they got the Foxer out, uh, which was an apparatus, a, a tube approximately 30 inches long with a lot of metal tied to it, and it would make the sound of your screws. And the acoustic torpedo would hit the Foxer, as we called it, before it would hit you. In the case of the Donnell, it hit the Foxer. And where we're sitting right now was curled up to that three-inch gun. 35 foot of her. The rudders were gone, the screws were gone. Uh, immediately we heard the explosion. We went to her aid. When we come alongside of her, we saw the mess she was in. Some of the people were in the water. Uh, the hopping uh, came to our aid also. Uh, she screened us before, because she she radioed us that she had a sound contact on the sub and she went chasing the sub while we start picking up the survivors. Uh, we got our motor whale boat into the water, got alongside the Donnell and uh, took on 26 of her wounded. We only took the wounded. Uh, later on, the hopping came back and we tried to take the uh, Donnell under tow and in that rough weather it was uh, getting nowhere so uh, the hopping took on some of her uh, uh, crew uh, not the wounded and they kept the skeleton crew aboard the Darnell and they stayed aboard the Darnell until she arrived in uh, in England in uh, Londonary Ireland uh, a British ocean-going tug uh, picked up the Donnell and brought her in. Uh, not picked it up, but took her on the tow and uh, brought her in. Uh, we were told to run ahead because we had the wounded, some of them were serious, and we got into London Derry with the, with the wounded. Uh, the Reeves was uh, the fifth ship to uh, enter uh, Tokyo Bay, and the first to tie up uh, at a pier in Tokyo Harbor. Uh, this mission was to rescue POWs. Uh, could you relate this story? Okay. Um, Commander Stassen, who later on became governor of Michigan, he was in charge of this task force. And we had him aboard our ship. And uh, we took on the uh, Japanese uh, pilots going into the uh, Tokyo Harbor, about 10 or 12 of them. And basically they were to lead us through the minefields. We had minesweepers in front of us. Uh, we were the fifth ship into Tokyo Harbor, and we proceeded into uh, the dock to tying uh, to tie up and to uh, uh, find out where these different prisons were, and to go to them and get the uh, uh, prisoners out. Uh, we had the job of uh, emptying out a Mori prison camp. Uh, a Mori prison camp had uh, people like Pappy Boyington in, who was a, uh, a Marine uh, pilot. Uh, they made him a major while he was uh, uh, captured. And at that time, we never knew that he was captured. We, we gave him up as missing in action. Uh, we rescued him. We rescued uh, Commander uh, Dick O'Kane who was the skipper of the USS Tang. And both of these gentlemen uh, received the Medal of Honor. Pass up. 
I can't say the word. Posthumously? Posthumously. Posthumously? That's a, that's a tongue twister for yeah. me. But um, when they came aboard, uh, we, we told them that they had gotten a Medal of Honor, and I'll never forget what Major Boyington said. He says, oh, great, that gives me $5 more a month. <laughs> Typical bappy. <laughs> but uh, at one time, we had uh, three Medal of Honor winners aboard our ship. As you know, the Reeves was named after Chief uh, Raiderman aboard the California. It blew up during uh, Pearl Harbor. He received the Medal of Honor for passing ammunition when the hydraulic systems went out on the, uh, uh, I believe it was the eight inch guns. And uh, uh, he got the Medal of Honor there and Boyington had the Medal of Honor and O'Kane had the Medal of Honor. So we had three of them aboard the ship at one time. We got out about 650 some odd people uh, while we were in Japan. We went from uh, Yokohama, which had a Mori prison camp, and we went into uh, uh, Nagoya, and at Nagoya they had a lot of uh, uh, clergy in prison camps, and the Japanese treat them fairly well. Uh, they didn't endure any beatings or anything like that, but they had uh, uh, a lot of women, a lot of ministers, uh, Catholic priests, Catholic nuns, uh, strictly clergy. And we uh, took out about uh, 30 or 40 of them out of Nagoya. Uh, later on we got the word to go to Nagasaki and we uh, picked up uh, doctors and the media and we uh, went into Nagasaki Harbor and uh, put them ashore and the place was really a mess. I never seen anything so destroyed in all my life. It's just too bad that at that time they didn't take all the big deals and all the presidents and all the ambassadors of the world and walked them through that place. Because being there is one thing, looking at pictures is another thing. I think they would have had a, a different outlook of what that bomb could do. I understand uh, currently the Reeves is still on uh, active duty in uh, Ecuador. Yeah. Could you uh, please explain that? Yeah, she was decommissioned in July of 1946. She remained in Green Coast Springs, Florida until 1962. In 1962, they towed her down to Ecuador, South America, and she's tied up alongside of uh, a dock like the Slater is here and supplying uh, electricity for the town. Uh, basically, the Darnell, after the securing of uh, D-Day in Cherbourg, they brought her into Cherbourg and she did the same thing that the Reeves is doing right now in Ecuador. Supplies power to the city of Cherbourg. What about the meals on uh, board the ship? Well, in the, in the North Atlantic, when it got too rough, meals were, most of the times, sandwiches. Uh, it, it was just too rough for the cooks to do anything up there. And uh, once we got into calmer waters, the, the food was great. Uh, the only only thing is we had a an Italian cook by the name of Bonacorso, and we'd always ask him to cook an Italian meal for us. And he was the worst Italian cook that you could ever see. And we had to get a Polak from Nebraska by the name of Schmeichel, and he would make up a spaghetti and meatballs or lasagna meal that you wouldn't believe. And he tried to teach Bonacorso how to, te how to cook Italian. But uh, Bonacorso uh, was good for breakfast. Oh man, he put out breakfast. 
uh, pancakes to French toast to SOS and, and believe it or not a lot of people complain about SOS hey I enjoy SOS even to this day I, I like uh, SOS um, any once we got into the Pacific though being it was calmer waters you got your three square meals and you didn't have to worry so much about uh, sandwich of course uh, we did run into uh, a typhoon in Okinawa. We ran into a typhoon in the Philippines while we were down there. And uh, here again it reminded us of uh, the Atlantic. And in rough weather, you just don't eat properly. Any humorous uh, stories involving uh, shipboard life? Well, I think I already told you one about the cook. <laughs> he, he was one of them. Uh, yeah, we used to play jokes on each other. Uh, I, I recall one time when uh, we all got together. We had we had a fellow by the name. Well, I won't name him because he's still alive. And I don't want this tape to get to him. But uh, but we uh, we considered him the lover of the ship, and uh, a bunch of us got together and we got our old envelopes that we got from home and changed the name to his name and when mail call came we would add these envelopes to his batch you know there was his name we'll call him John and uh, man he got he got a stack that high and, and then he realized that uh, hey after he started opening these things he'd find toilet paper in them <laughs> And uh, uh, some some of the papers in there with some choice words such as <laughs> go to hell, but uh, <laughs> better than that. And uh, that's one of the things. Uh, I, I think most of the humor was when you come to a, a shore and you go on liberty. And uh, once you got back from uh, liberty, then you could uh, tell your tales. But I remember when we was in Brooklyn Navy Yard and the entire crew got hell over this. Uh, one of our engineers, in fact he was a water tender, he put on the bow of the ship where the number 156 was and right underneath he put in letters almost twice the size of 156 for sale. <laughs> the skipper didn't really enjoy that. <laughs> Not at all. And next, next morning when we went to muster, and that's another thing, we don't really know how long that for sale sign was on that bow. It might have been there for a couple of days, but uh, it was spotted by the old man, and uh, of course he reamed us all out, and he threatened us with no uh, liberty, but uh, eventually everything cooled off and it was painted over. Um, when you weren't uh, working or standing watch, uh, what pastimes were available? What, what? What pastimes were available? Oh, okay. Uh, and we played cards, played checkers, played chess, all the regular games. The only game I, I don't recall is having a Monopoly game, which uh, once I got out of service and uh, getting married and having the children, Monopoly was the big thing. I imagine today's Navy, they must have a Monopoly game aboard. But basically, it was most of the gambling games. Uh, shooting dice right after payday. Uh, we had a couple of guys with guitars, and they would come out here in a fantail and play guitars. A lot of this happened, again, in the Pacific. The Atlantic was just too rough to do any entertaining. Uh, oh, that's about it. Card playing, chess. Were there uh, any movies about available or news? Uh, movies, movies. Okay, uh, in any in the Atlantic, we very seldom had any uh, movies. First of all, the movies had to be set up in the uh, uh, in a mess hall, and the further forward you go on these ships, the rougher it gets. So it was really no fun watching movies up in the forward part of the ship. Uh, if you were in a Brooklyn Navy Yard, fine, 
you'd have movies on a fantail here. But if you were in Europe, you weren't allowed to have any lights out. It was a darkened ship, even in Europe. In the Pacific, uh, we would have uh, movies back aft, but strictly everything was inside. Couldn't have uh, movies on top side. Everything was dark and ship at that time. Um, were snacks and treats available? Yeah, we had uh, we had candy uh, available. Uh, let me say something about milk and why I drink coffee to this day, black and no sugar. Uh, as, a, as a kid of 17, I loved my bowl of cereal in the morning before I went to school. And when I got aboard ship, the Reeves, I enjoyed my bowl of cereal. But then I found out that by the time we were two days out at sea, the fresh milk was gone and we had to use powdered milk. And of course, no one told me about it. And I said, something's wrong with this cereal that uh, one day. And then they told me about this powdered milk. And I'd have powdered milk in the, uh, in the coffee. That stuff would stay with you the entire day. And from that time on, no more powdered milk. Uh, remember, World War II, we didn't have frozen commodities as we have today. Uh, your fresh vegetables ran out. When they ran out, when you got out to sea, about four or five days out to sea, the fresh vegetables were gone, and you go back to can. Uh, even potatoes, fresh potatoes, once they were added at the spud locker, and the spud locker had empty, you'd go to uh, uh, regular dehydrated potatoes, I think they called it in those days. But uh, yeah, we had candy as long as it would last. Very seldom did we have ice cream. In the Pacific, it was a good deal to have ice cream out there, and we'd used to get it from the aircraft carriers if you happened to pick up one of their guys. And you'd get enough ice cream for the entire crew. But a lot of that stuff was at a premium of getting it. You wouldn't get it until you come ashore. Um, did your ship ever have swim call? In the Pacific, yeah. We had swim call in the Pacific. In fact, uh, uh, I remember the uh, island of Ulithi, which was a big base for us. From there we would hit uh, the Philippines and Okinawa and Iwo Jima and all the rest of them. But it was a big base. They had an island there called Mog Mog. And we used to go to Mog Mog and get our three cans of beer, which was 3.2 beer, or near beer as they used to call it, and have our parties there and fights <laughs> amongst the different crews. Uh, but we'd have swim parties uh, in those different islands. And you'd swim right off the, off the decks here. Um, did you have any field day activities? Field day? You mean cleaning up? That, that was usually a field day activity to us. Is air our beddings over the side, would throw our mattress right on a, overlap it. And it was a nice, calm, cool, day like you have today, uh, sun beating down, we'd have our air bedding. Uh, then we had regular cleanup field days where we would possibly prepare for a captain's inspection or the commodore's inspection. The commodore usually was the man in charge of the six destroyer escorts, the flag, so to speak. Um, what about holidays at sea, like Thanksgiving or Christmas? Well, the most memorable holiday that I can think of, we were in Nagasaki. We had just spent Thanksgiving Day there, and uh, the old man really went all out. We had turkey, we had all the trimmings, the works. The war was over, and uh, he came there that afternoon and told us, we're going home. And we put up our... Uh, homecoming pen pennant the next day and we took on 150 uh, different uh, military personnel because we had the space for them as an APD and we went home with them. It took us approximately, I think it was almost uh, 30 some odd days to get to San Diego, California. It was a long drawn out trip. But that's, that's one uh, Thanksgiving I'll never forget. What about religious services? 
The what? Religious services? Uh, on a DE, naturally, we didn't ca carry a chaplain, but uh, here again, in, in the Atlantic, uh, you just couldn't do these things, and so you'd uh, pray in your own way. But once we got into the Pacific, where it got a little bit calmer, uh, we did have religious services. And uh, one of the officers, or, or one of the, uh, most of the time is one of the officers who would take the duties of a chaplain. And uh, whether, whether he was uh, Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, uh, or whatnot, we'd all pray in our own way uh, aboard ship. Uh, once we got into uh, different harbors, uh, we would go to various ships that had, let's say, Catholic services or Protestant services. And uh, we would uh, go over by motor whale boat to these different ships. There's your background music. <laughs> How did you uh, stay in touch with your family? Through mail. Oh, wait till that gets over with. Uh, while we were in the Atlantic, being I lived in Ridgewood, Queens, uh, I even told my folks, don't bother writing to me, don't bother sending me any mail or any packages, because I'm going to be home before I get that piece of mail or package. Uh, the average trip there and back was approximately six weeks. So every six weeks, I'd be home. And I'd get on the Flushing Avenue trolley and go home from Brooklyn Navy Yard. Then uh, later on, when uh, we got converted to an APD in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, well, then uh, my home port was San Diego, California. And from there, we went into the Pacific. There, they, they sent me mail. And I would send them at that time what was known as V-mail. And... Uh, it, it was a small piece of paper and you'd have to write on it and they, you'd get free mail because you were in the military. And of course you had the Census Bureau, which it was our offices that would have to censor your mail. And the thing that you couldn't uh, divulge is where you were and what you were doing and what was happening. How frequent was mail call? How efficient? Well, Whenever the mail would catch up with the fleet, we would get mail. Uh, while we were in Okinawa, uh, for the 109 days, I think we got mail three times. So that's approximately uh, once a month you, you would get mail. And then at one time, one of the LCIs, which was carrying mail for the uh, fleet at that time, uh, got kamikaze, so we were hoping that not too much of the mail was destroyed. How do you look back upon your destroyer escort experiences? Uh, something I, th I don't think I would have wanted to miss. And when I look back a as a kid from 17 to 21, uh, it's an experience I, I never would want to miss. And uh, to this day, we keep in contact through our reunions. That's about all I can, can say uh, about it. It's something that I, I, I never would have wanted to miss. I met a lot of friends. I made a lot of friends. I've been best man for some of my shipmates. When after the war was over, uh, he got married. He asked me to come to Philadelphia and be his best man. It's that kind of friendship that we had. And it happened to be the only ship I was on during the entire World War II. Altogether different than when I got called back to Korea. In 22 months I was spent on four different ships. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with me. Thank you uh, very much for sharing these experiences with future generations. Is there any other comments uh, you'd like to make? The only comment I'd like to make right now, Dan, is the good job that you're doing. It's great to see uh, a person of your age get involved. 
Uh, I have I happen to have ten grandsons, and I wish at least one of them would get this involved. Although I think possibly by uh, this coming February uh, he may enlist in the Navy, as his father did and his grandfather did. But it's good to see you young people getting involved. Great. I hope you're successful in getting your Eagle Scout. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good job.